Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the blood. The blood is this red liquid that's uh, flowing through our body, and I think everyone knows that it's pretty critical. And I think we, people have known that for a long time. It's almost kind of magical. People knew before they understood all the ingredients and components of blood. They knew that if you lost too much blood, that that, you, that might mean that you're going to lose your life as well. And so there's something kind of very critical about the blood. And so this particular discussion, and let's like get right into this. This particular discussion on the blood is going to be the first part in a series on uh, videos that I'm going to put together uh, trying to talk about the basics of blood. And so this particular video is an introduction to blood and in particular a look at the red blood cell. And so right out of the gate, what I want to say about this is that as I mentioned before, the blood is a type of connective tissue. And what that could mean, I mean, there's a, several types of connective tissue. There, the, the, your bone is connective tissue, adipose tissue is connective tissue, your tendons, ligaments. But a characteristic of connective tissue is that the cells are not very close together and that there is an extracellular matrix between them. Now, this is an incredible photograph right here with the scanning electron micrograph showing red blood cells in a blood vessel. And so all of this material that I'm sort of pointing at right here is the, is the matrix between the cells. And you might know it simply as plasma, the liquid of the blood. And so flowing in that plasma are all sorts of things like water, proteins and nutrients that we eat and, hor and hormones. And then there's uh, some cellular components, the solid things inside the blood. And so those cellular components are cells such as red cells, white blood cells, and even fragments of cells called platelets. And they all do different things. Now, with regard to function of the blood, it's so varied that it's difficult to discuss it, but I'll touch it on, on it briefly. It basically carries and transports things through the body. And principally, like, well, what, what is it that it's carrying? Um, it's mostly, m most importantly, it's carrying oxygen. And red blood cells are doing the bulk of that. But it's also carrying carbon dioxide out of the body. But it's also, as I mentioned before, carrying things in this plasma, important proteins and nutrients and hormones. And I might be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that the white blood cells are very, very important in fighting off disease. And then platelets are helpful in um, the blood um, stopping bleeding. And so you have a lot of diversity and functionality, but you know you, you wouldn't know it necessarily. I mean, if you go into the into the doctors to have some blood drawn, this might look familiar. Here's the needle going into your venous system, and when blood is drawn out here um, using negative pressure of this syringe, and it's and then it's drawn into a test tube. Usually, the person doing that is either a physician or a nurse or a specialist in doing so, drawing blood, which is called the phlebot phlebotomist. That's kind of a cool term. Now the blood is then collected in this test tube. Now without, if it was just an empty test tube, the blood would have a tendency to clot. And so usually there's some kind of anticoagulant pre present in the test tube to prevent that. Something such as the chemical CPD, citric phosphate dextrose would prevent that from occurring. And so once the blood is then put into a test tube, we usually like to spin it down in a centrifuge. Not this particular type of one, this is a micro centrifuge, but at the hospital they have a little larger one where you put test tubes in there and spin it down. The reason being that if you looked at this test tube a couple of hours from now, if you just set it on the lab bench, what would happen is that the red blood cells would actually sink to the bottom. And you're like, well, that's kind of weird. Well, it's like Italian salad dressing. You know, the heavy seasoning will, will sink to the bottom and the oil will be on the top. What I mean by that is then you would take your dressing and sort of shake it up. And so we call that kind of a mixture a suspension. And what's keeping the cells all moving around like this is the flow of blood pressure from the heart. But if we wanted to separate the components of the blood, we put it in the centrifuge and that spins it around so rapidly that the more dense cells, which being the red cells, go to the bottom of the test tube and then you can actually see the separation of the fluid, which is between the cells, called the plasma, which is up above. And let me show you this. Like if, you, if I actually took 
um, this pen and attempted to make a drawing of this. And if I did this, here's a test tube, kind of a simple approach to this. And if I said that after several minutes in the centrifuge, you would have your red blood cells located here on the bottom. And they're most dense because they carry uh, a metal, iron, they, they have a protein inside of them called hemoglobin, and the protein contains iron, and that's what holds on to the oxygen, and so they're very dense. And then right above the red blood cells, you get this pretty thin layer right here of white blood cells and platelets. Now, it's thin because there's fewer of the white blood cells than the red blood cells, a lot more, uh, a lot less, I meant to say. And then above here, you would have this sort of yellowish color clear liquid that has all sorts of things in it. It's mostly water, but it does have the proteins in it and it has vitamins and it has salts and nutrients. And we call this the plasma. So let me spell that out there. So plasma. Uh, and so this plasma, which literally means liquid, is almost half the, uh, half the volume of the blood, but it's a little bit more than that. It's about 55% normally. Okay, and then down here, the red cells down here are usually comprised, or cells in general, about 45%. And so this is typical, or, or normal, if you will, when you separate the blood in a centrifuge. And so this is what it really looks like. Uh, here's the plasma, here's a real picture of it, and here's the red blood cells. And this white layer, called the buffy coat, because it's white, is um, sort of the interface between the, the the plasma and the red cells. Now, what's interesting about this is that of the total volume, if the red blood cells uh, made up 45%, that's what we would call the hematocrit, which is a blood fraction. So the amount of cells, 45%, this would be 50%, 55% for plasma. Okay. Now that's typically normal. I, I'll mention in a couple of minutes um, that there are some examples of, of a blood dis, uh, disorders that will affect the hematocrit. And so I just want to point that out. Now, if you're looking at the, the, the cells, this is a really awesome picture, again, of the scanning electron microscope. Here's the red blood cell. And they're very small, and they're very thin, and they're, they're sort of indent, indented like this, sort of con concave, if you will, sort of like a head resting on a pillow for a long time, so concave. And here's the platelet that sort of has all these extensions sticking off of it. Um, the, the thing about platelets is that they can uh, hook to each other and form a platelet plug which stops bleeding. It kind of reminds me of like a barrel of monkeys with all these little hooks on the monkeys. And then of course this is the white blood cell which is responsible for defense of the body. And so everything else would be the liquid or plasma that you're, that you're not able to see. And so the white blood cells, you know, I, I go back here and I said, well, you know, here's a picture of a white blood cell scanning electron micrograph. But here are white blood cells, though they're not white, they're stained kind of um, a reddish purple color. Usually we stain blood with this staining technique or stain called Wright's, and that's with a W, Wright's stain. And what's interesting is uh, this particular video won't discuss it, but there's five different kinds of white blood cells. And so they, they're all specialized in some particular means of defending the body. And so they're kind of classified either having these little granules, if you notice that this cell has granules and this one has a lot of them that are stained in this one. So there's three of them that are granular sites and two right here that are agranular. And so these do different things and they have different names, kind of cool. And so the plasma, getting back to, this is a great diagram here of, a, of the separation of the plasma, which is around 55% and the 45, which constitutes all the cells collectively. And so this is your 41% would be the hematocrit and that's typically normal. But the plasma, just to emphasize it again, is 90% water. And so, this, there's a significant amount of water circulating in the blood. And so what else is in that plasma other than just water? Again, there's proteins that are, that are dissolved into the plasma. 
And I'll mention that in a separate video because they're very significant, but there's nutrients in the plasma, there's hormones in the plasma, there's salts in the plasma, even some things that we're gonna call cellular waste, things like nitrogenous waste, like urea and uric acid can be found in here as well. Now, of course, the word waste suggests that we don't want it, and so those things are removed from the blood, from the plasma by the kidneys, and so that's kind of cool. So here's your typical uh, test tube of your plasma and your normal, again, 45% red blood cell, but if your hematocrit was something less, like say it was 20%, that would constitute a disorder called anemia or lacking of red blood cells. You notice how they're so few. Now there's consequences for that symptom wise in terms of if the red blood cells main function is to carry oxygen, obviously we would be tired and lacking energy, for example. And then here would be the opposite of that would be polycythemia which is an abundant amount of red blood cells. So this brings up an issue. This is a, there's a lot more rare. There's several instances that can cause anemia. You can be, have dietary anemia. You can have some sort of um, le leukemia can cause anemia as well. And you can have sickle cell anemia. So there's, there's many causal agents of anemia. But this brings up a particular point. What's interesting is if the blood is normally uh, about 45% red blood cell hematocrit. That must mean that there's some kind of mechanism where the body is, knows when to make more red blood cells and when not to make more red blood cells. So there's some kind of regulatory mechanism at play here. So that's gonna be part of our discussion. And again, this is a great shot of the plasma, the buffy coat, and the red cells. So here's that again, an awesome photograph of a red blood cell. Look at this, it's, it's concave here, but what's curious is that it's concave on the other side as well. It's very, very thin. And so what is it? It's a membrane and enclosed inside are, you ready for this? 300 million molecules of hemoglobin protein. And so that's a lot. And so, and you know, well, there are a lot of red blood cells. There is a tremendous amount of red blood cells. Uh, some estimates show that the number of red blood cells, if you took the total number of cells in the whole body, it would be about 25% red blood cells. And then, so that's a lot of hemoglobin. And so these red blood cells or erythrocytes, Greek meaning red cell, are biconcave discs. So they're concave on both sides and they carry a lot of hemoglobin. The point is that this cell is specialized for diffusion of oxygen. In particular and so you can't get a better diffusion rate if you're small and if you're flat these are the two things that maximize it especially if you're indented in the center I mean you can still get puffy on the sides which allow for more hemoglobin but that indentation allows for maximum diffusion rate and so they're small and flat discs and they're and they're numerous and so they're obviously red and the red nature comes from the fact that when oxygen combines with the hemoglobin and iron in particular, it forms that sort of magenta rust color known as oxyhemoglobin. And so here's a picture of hemoglobin. You might be familiar with it. It's, uh, it's kind of large. It's made up of four subunits or four polypeptides making the one protein. And then there's this ring structure. And in the center of the ring, uh, sort of this perforin ring structure, if you're into biochemistry, there's an iron atom which attaches uh, to the oxygen. So oxygen can attach there, 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 and there. So you can have four atoms of oxygen attached at one particular time on hemoglobin. And so what's the point of it? Well, here's a picture of uh, blood vessels. So let me sort of just walk you through this. Say you're a red blood cell like this or like this, and you're cruising down here in an artery, which is a blood vessel taking the blood away from the heart. And notice here how it's red, so it's highly oxygenated. Uh, the heart is pumping oxygenated blood to the rest of the body in, the, in what is known as the systemic circuit to the, to the systems of the body. So the red blood cells cruising along this artery, and then it randomly takes a turn here in an arterial, and then it'll eventually reach the smallest blood vessels of all, which are known as capillaries. And in the capillary bed, 
what happens is the oxygen simply diffuses into the tissue, surrounding tissue that needs it. And then as a result of it, there's not much more oxygen in the, in the red blood cell, and so it takes on a darker coloration. Not exactly blue, but it's certainly darker in coloration. And so then that turns into a venule and then ultimately into a larger diameter vessel called a vein, and that's heading toward the heart. Veins are blood vessels toward the heart and arteries are away from the heart. Okay, and so that's a, that's a brief look at that. And so when I was mentioning bright blood, this is what I mean. So this is oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. So you might be familiar with the heart. The heart is a, a large organ that in the center of our chest that's pumping the blood. And so it's creating the pressure. And so it's pumping it to two places, it's pumping it to the lungs, and then it's pumping it to the rest of the body. And it's divided into chambers, four chambers. So it's this right side over here, anatomical right, that is the darker coloration of blood because it's receiving deoxygenated blood. And then it's pumping it to the lungs right there and what is known as the pulmonary artery. And then it's receiving blood from the lungs, which is oxygenated, so it's bright red, full of oxygen, ready to go out to the body. And then it goes into the left ventricle and it's, it's pumped out at the aorta and it travels to the rest of the body delivering. So what's interesting is when you collect the blood in a test tube, I was mentioning like 45% hematocrit, but that doesn't tell you the exact count of red blood cells. If you really wanted the, the exact number of red blood cells, you'd have to make a blood smear and actually count them, or at least uh, do an estimate on a slide using a grid and you can count the cells. And so let me tell you, the numbers are quite staggering. In just one cubic millimeter, okay, cubic milliliter, I, I, I meant to say, or milli, millimeter, milliliter is the same thing. A cubic millimeter is a milliliter. In one milliliter of blood, we're talking about, look at this for an, an average male, has between five and six million red blood cells, and just, just a small amount of blood. And again, females slightly less than that, but still a staggering amount. And so that just shows you that the, the red blood cell is so important. And then if you were lacking in the red blood cell, again, anemia, you would be not doing well in terms of oxygen uh, delivery to the rest of the body, you'd be in trouble. Now, what's interesting is that you, you might know this, that you can donate blood. And so you go into a blood bank or, or a hospital and you can take out a, what is known as a unit of whole blood. Whole blood is referred to whole blood because it has everything. It has all the cells and it has plasma in it as well. So we have a lot of blood, so much so that we can actually donate. And so what is that? About 8% of your total weight of your body is blood. And it's about 12 pints. So we have 12 pints of blood in our body, although pints are, is a unit that is not necessarily something that's used internationally. And so we talk about it as being like the human body has approximately five liters, a little bit more of blood. But when you're donating blood, it kind of comes down, at least in the United States, comes down to donating one unit, which is approximately a pint, but it's 500 milliliters of blood. And usually it has, again, this chemical anticoagulant CPD in there. And it's very important that, that if you felt the need to donate blood, it's very, very important to do that. And it just takes a few minutes to donate and uh, your body basically grows it back. Uh, and, it, and it makes it, and it, re, it makes it in approximately a month you can grow those cells right back. And so what's interesting about that is that, again, the body must have some mechanism of knowing that it needs more red blood cells or it needs to make more after a donation, and it does know that. Speaking of producing red blood cells, something that you may have not thought about before is that when we were newly forming in our mother's body, in the uterus, we all started off as an embryo and then a fetus, now, an embryo and a fetus needs red blood cells to circulate. And so how, do they, how does that happen? Because you might be familiar with the fact that red blood cells are mostly produced in an adult and the red marrow of bones. And so an embryo clearly does not have bones. And, it, and at first, uh, it'll, it'll have cartilage and then the cartilage is converted to bone. But my point is that, did you know that we had something called a yolk sac? And inside the yolk sac, red blood cells are formed. And that's how a fetus gets 
to have its own red blood cells and it's also produced a little bit in the liver and spleen as well. But when you're older, your bone, and here's a typical long bone, so this is where your blood is produced in the red marrow, which is at the ends of the bones, and what's known as the epiphysis. So the epiphysis right in here and here contain the red marrow, and in those red marrow are a bunch of cells uh, that specialize into the different types of blood components, such as the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets, and we can look at that. Um, it's fascinating. So you have red marrow, and then in, in the center medulla, medullary cavity, there's yellow uh, marrow, which is mostly adipose tissue. What's interesting is the blood's produced here, and then it leaves. It's like, how does it get out? Well, it leaves through blood vessels, and then it circulates through the rest of the body. And so we make, we make our red blood cells in the bone, but what's totally fascinating is that the kidney, and you're like, what's that? That's a kidney. The kidney helps to regulate the production of red blood cells, and it does that by when, when blood goes to the kidney, it determines if there's a high amount of oxygen or a low amount of oxygen. So indirectly, it's able to detect the presence of red blood cells by, by sensing oxygen. And so what's interesting is it then produces a hormone called erythropoietin, a great name. Sometimes clinically, it's just referred to as EPO. It's a great name because it's a a hormone that is can give rise to poesis, in other words, to make, give rise to red cells. And so erythropoiesin is poetin, sorry, is made by the kidney in response to low oxygen. And so what's fascinating here is the erythropoiesin poetin gets into the bloodstream, then it travels to the bone. And again, what we're talking about is the ends of your femur, which is your thigh bone, and in your arms. But there is also a little bit of red pl blood production in, the, in your hip bones and a little bit in the sternum as well. But basically, when erythropoietin comes to the marrow, it says to make more red blood cells. And then when there's more red blood cells, then there's more oxygen capacity of the blood. And so therefore, that inhibits the production of the hormone. So there's negative feedback. So when there's high oxygen, there's no need to make more red blood cells. So if there's low oxygen, that means that the body should be making more red blood cells, which is kind of cool. That means that, for example, you could acclimate by, for example, if you were to take a trip, if you live normally at sea level and you went up high to high altitude where there's lower oxygen, your body would say, hey, you know, I'm lacking oxygen. Maybe I need to kick up the production of red blood cells. And so the kidney makes more erythropoietin. Then that travels to the red marrow, makes more red blood cells, which increases the oxygen capacity. So it's pretty clever. And so what's interesting is like, well, what gives with anemia then? Like how come the number of red blood cells are low? Well, there's, there's, it's a disorder. So one example of why that could be happening is that there could be dietary problems. In order to make red blood cells, you have to be eating iron, for example. And so a diet lacking iron, iron or a diet lacking a particular vitamin, which I, I will mention in a moment, B12 and folic acid could be the, could be the limiting um, causal effect for anemia. But in the red marrow, you have these stem cells called hemocytoblasts, and these differentiate and divide. This is actually a simplified diagram. There's actually more intermediates. These cells in between are called intermediates, and these are the final products that are circulating in the blood down below. I've been talking about erythrocytes, but again, here are the five different kinds of white cells, which are called leukocytes, and then here are these thrombocytes or platelets. Um, What's interesting is this big guy called the megakaryocyte. In other words, big nucleus cell uh, fragments into platelets. Then th these are the white blood cells. And then the thing about the red blood cell production, and let's emphasize that. Let's get a different diagram. What, what you have to do if you're making a red blood cell is you got to make a lot of them. So they divide very, very rapidly. And so not only do they divide rapidly, is that you've got to make a lot of protein. And if you're making a lot of protein, that means 
that the cell has to crank out a lot of ribosomes because those are the organelles that make protein. And if you want to store a tremendous amount of hemoglobin, do you notice here that when you're accumulating the hemoglobin, one of the things that you want to do is to create more space, you can actually then, once your hemoglobin is produced, you can get rid of your nucleus. You can jettison your nucleus, eject the nucleus. Now, this is sort of a, um, a fatal move for a cell because that means that the, the cell is, uh, doesn't, the, the mature red blood cell does not contain a nucleus. And so it's, its days are numbered in terms of its longevity, but that's okay. By the fact that it doesn't have a nucleus, it can carry more hemoglobin, but maybe more importantly, it allows the cell to be more flexible. And so it allows it to be able to move through these very small blood vessels known as capillaries. And they get contorted when they move and they squeeze through. The size of a red blood cell is about the, the diameter of a capillary. And so there's a lot of wear and tear on these red blood cells. And so therefore they last about only like three months and, and then they get recycled. And so, you know, what do you mean recycled? Well, white blood cells will come around and eat them when they, when they have a distorted appearance. And so the fact that it doesn't have a nucleus this is a good shot showing that the red blood cells are about the diameter of a capillary and they fit through one by one. And so they get damaged when they move through the capillaries. And so when they get all beat up, then a white blood cell, and this one happens to be a granular site known as a neutrophil. The neutrophil comes along and it actually engulfs through phagocytosis, the red blood cell. Now, that may seem brutal and you're like, well, if you eliminate red blood cells, oh no, I'm going to become anemic. No, no. Then again, the marrow will produce more. But I just want to mention the importance of this recycling mechanism a little bit later. But I want to emphasize that if you want to make more red blood cells, you want to make sure that you're getting a diet that's high in it in vitamin B12 and in folic acid. That's very important. Now, you might like here's a picture of vitamin B12 and folic acid. And you're like, well, what foods contain that? Well, if you're interested in that, you could pause the video and simply look up foods containing, top 10 foods containing B12 and folic acid and choose your, your favorites amongst, amongst those. But not only that, but iron is really important because iron is inside each of these cells which helps to hold on to the oxygen. So I actually put down some food sources here. Meat obviously is a good source of iron, but if you're vegetarian, there's all kinds of uh, vegetable options for you. And so you wanna make sure that you're eating a healthy diet. The thing about B12 and folic acid, there's nothing magical about those two things other than the fact that they're needed for DNA synthesis. And in fact, all cells need that in terms of division, but it's just that the red blood cells are dividing so rapidly that they need it more than other cells. And so if you're getting B12 folic acid in your, in your food, now this is a simplified small intestine here. So you're eating these things, it's absorbed, goes into the blood, and then it goes to your red marrow. And therefore it helps to make more red blood cells. Your red blood cells leave the bone. They're cruising around three months. They get all beat up. Then, in the either in the liver or in the spleen, white blood cells are are in, engulfing them. And so, what I mean by recycle is the globin part, the protein part. That's easy. The globin is just simply recycled and it's used. Those peptides are used for for whatever purpose the body needs proteins. But what's curious in, about the the breakdown of red blood cells in hemoglobin in particular is that heme. That heme is a and again, you can call up a, a diagram of this on the internet, but a heme is this perforin ring with an iron in the center. And so what happens is that the, the heme right here is fractured open and it forms this interesting so, sort of linear structure called Billy Verdon. And Billy Verdon is then converted in the liver to Billy Rubin. Now, Billy Rubin, just, I know it's starting to sound complicated, but Billy Rubin is the, the final product of the breakdown of hemoglobin, and in particular the heme. So what's the story with it? Well, it, it's a pigment type of molecule, so such that, that when it goes into the bile, and then that's 
released into the intestine, it actually helps to create coloration in the feces. And it bilirubin can also be removed by the kidney. And so it creates kind of this yellowish, orangish color, which is makes the urine the yellow color that we know that it is. Now, it's not just uh, bilirubin that creates the yellow urine. There's some vitamins that can create uh, some yellow as well. Thymine in particular can do that. But I want to mention this bilirubin is kind of important because as it turns out, the liver is responsible for, for this whole process of, of, of taking the bilirubin from the, from the heme and getting rid of it. And so if there's some kind of liver stress, like there's an infection of the liver, some sort of uh, um, some kind of problem with the, the liver in general. And so you can have an infection of the liver, um, you can have a bacteria or virus infection, um, and that could cause jaundice to occur, which is a yellowing of the skin. Hep hepatitis is, is what I'm getting at. Any kind of infection. Now, that could be serious because bilirubin is something that we want to get rid of. And so, uh, you know, there, there's issue with that. And then one final thing that I want to mention is that sometimes a newborn baby, especially if it's a premature newborn baby, Sometimes the, the new baby's liver isn't working up to speed yet. It's not quite going full strength. And so the bilirubin levels can get kind of high in a newborn. And so it results in the fact that the skin actually is turning kind of orangish yellow. And so that's called newborn jaundice. And not to say that it's overly significant, but it is a little bit because high levels of, of that can be kind of problematic for the baby. And so the usually what a physician will have you do is go into the hospital and have the baby's like heel of their foot pricked and a little sample of bilirubin is tested. And so one of the treatments, and I find this to be kind of interesting, is a, a, a photo treatment. In other words, just simply light is capable of, of altering the structure of bilirubin and, and, and breaking it down, or at least making it a little bit easier to be broken down by the by the newborn. And so I hope you enjoyed this introductory video on the blood and in particular emphasis on red blood cells or erythrocytes. Thanks for watching.